Hello everyone. I would like to weigh in on the legacy Mockingbird Media and their claim that because Trump publicly asked if they could, if someone could hack Hillary, I think if the Russians could hack Hillary, and then that same day, I guess, the DNC server was hacked. Um, so, of course, the mainstream media wants to lie to everyone and pretend like that is somehow a smoking gun. Um, and as a cybersecurity expert, expert, <laughs> but compared to most of you, I am a cybersecurity expert. Um, as someone who works in the field, I can tell you that that's not how a red team, you don't, you don't do a hack in a day. Uh, the information gathering stage, the reconnaissance stage of a hack can could be a year long um so this idea that you know that donald trump gets on tv and they're like oh yeah they heard it there it is that's our that's our you know that's our cue to go do this hack that's nonsense um there would have to have been a lot of planning up to that point in order for that to be the case now the fact of the matter is the group that's being accused of this hack APT26 or APT28, the fancy bear. I don't remember uh, which designation, if they're 26 or 28. Um, but what that means is they're an advanced persistent threat, meaning that they're advanced enough to have the capabilities of a state-sponsored actor, and they're persistent, meaning they've been present in our government systems for, I think, about a decade, maybe more. Um, so we've known about Fancy Bear, and they've been, you know, getting into different, uh, and, you know, sort of prodding the vulnerability of different government systems for a long time, and that's how we're aware of them, and that's why they have this name of Advanced Persistent Threat, number 26 or number 28, or again, whichever one it is. Um, this is Fancy Bear and Dancing Bear, I don't remember which numbers they are, um, so that's interesting, but it would kind of then bring up the question has you know have they been working with trump for 10 years or did you know did they maybe act on his behalf without his knowledge uh because the other side of that too is there was all these um facebook ads that were bought by the 13 russians who were due to be indicted um and you know what the mainstream media isn't really vocal about the the part of that that they leave out is that, yeah, they, they bought pro-Trump ads, but they also bought pro-Bernie ads. So is this, is this whatever, is this Russian influence, are they pro-Trump or are they really just anti-Hillary? Because that seems to be more of uh, the vein that I see, more of the attitude that I see is just anti-Hillary, anyone but her. <clears throat> A lot of Americans felt that way too, interestingly enough. Um, and then, you know, and then so you have to take all of that and you go, okay, so Occam's Razor, 10 years of planning or whatever, maybe just two years of planning and working with Donald Trump, um, or, or maybe just a DNC intern who got firsthand experience of what was going on, decided one afternoon uh, that I'm going to blow the lid off of this because I support Bernie and I'm, I'm tired of feeling like my voice doesn't count and, and the voice of all the, the people who, you know, the group of people who I identify with doesn't count. Um, I, I think that's a lot more likely um, than some state-sponsored, uh, you know, hacking group that just is going to go retrieve the emails and then deliver them to WikiLeaks. I think if it was a, a Russian state-sponsored group, they would have got the emails and either used them for financial gain or uh, used them really to maybe destroy our democratic process in a much worse fashion, if that's what they were really trying to go, right? They, they would have there's a lot of ways they could have used that information differently. You know, just start thinking about if, if you had all of those emails and, and all of the tertiary information that goes with that, right? If you've hacked an email server, you probably have access to addresses and phone numbers and, you know, locations at daycares and gosh knows what kind of stuff you could scrape from all that, right? So 
Um, there's a lot much, there's, there's a lot more dangerous kind of aspect to that than just the sort of the, the content of the collusion between CNN and the DNC and, uh, you know, some of the Podesta emails and this kind of stuff. Um, so there's the other reason where I feel like, you know, it, it points more to a disgruntled staffer who was like upset with the political process than a state actor who was trying to bring us down because if it was a state actor, they would have gone the extra mile and they would have continued to use uh, all of that going forward in other ways there's more information that that's incredibly strategically advan advantageous for a state actor that um you know we just haven't we just haven't seen that kind of fallout like uh i, I you know and again I, I don't know maybe maybe there's some information that's being repressed like maybe all of these people all these dnc staffers had to have all their credit card numbers changed and all their phone numbers changed and all this kind of stuff uh because it fell into the hands of russians but I don't think that's the case. It doesn't seem like that's the case. There's no talk about any worry of really the disclosure of that kind of personal information. It was more about trying to hide the content of those emails and distract people from the content by pretending like, ooh, my Russia. So that's kind of what I see there. Um, and then there's another point. So all of this, and, and immediately within a, a short period of time, all intel agencies come together and agree that it was russia despite none of them having forensically examined the email server that was compromised um without a forensic examination of the physical machine itself of the memory and the the hard drives or the solid state memory whatever it is without a forensic examination of that data you don't know jack period you don't know jack uh, so the idea that these intel agencies have come to some conclusion is nonsense. And of course, that has been sort of reported on, you know, it, I think it started as like 16 intel agencies and now it's down to like, whatever, just the big ones, the CIA, FBI, NSA. I, I'm not really sure. I haven't looked into that angle recently, but the point is that without physically possessing the server, which let's not forget it disappeared. It was stolen. The physical server was stolen, and that's one of the reasons that it was never uh, forensically investigated by any of the intel agencies, because it disappeared. So, without that forensic investigation of the actual physical machine, you can't draw any conclusions. Not, not real conclusions. Uh, you can make speculation, and you can say, well, evidence points this way, and evidence maybe would lead us in, to think this direction, but... Without the forensic data, you have really uh, a weak position. Um, and so then, then I started thinking about, you know, it was disclosed at one point, and, and we have the audit of the Pentagon, but at one point the, there was a solid figure of about $51 billion in black budget spending for the Pentagon. And let's assume for a minute that the president actually does get briefed on all of that. Even if the president gets briefed, there's no way that any one person can stay abreast of all of that activity and research. So even if they're maybe aware of the headline titles of where certain dollar amounts went, they don't know what's really going on in those programs. They haven't visited the facilities or, or reviewed... Uh, day-to-day -day operations in any capacity because there isn't time it's just not possible and also we've compartmentalized and cellularized those uh, aspects of our intelligence and military communities under the auspices of national security um, which at this point i think is being taken advantage of it's it's real easy to get small groups of people all working together on a big project that don't realize they're actually working towards the same goal. Um, and one of the first times, well, maybe not the first time, but one of the best times we did this successfully as a country was the Manhattan Project, where we developed an atomic weapon to use during World War II. And most of the people working on that project did not know that that's what they were doing. And the ones who did know that that's what they were doing were not permitted to see the work of the other people, and they weren't permitted to know who 
the other people were, and so on and so forth. So it's very compartmentalized, and that continued into our um, deep military and sort of research apparatus uh, to this day. So it's fully... It's, it's impossible to think that any one president over the last six or seven decades um, has had a full scope of what's going on in black budget. So to assume that... Um, to assume that that this couldn't happen in Russia in the same way uh, would be foolish, right? Ultimately, even if you want to assume that it was Russia and it was uh, maybe some kind of state-sponsored group of people, that doesn't mean that they were acting in the capacity of the official government. They could still be acting rogue. Uh, we've seen our own government do this. The CIA, you know, smuggled drugs and people and... Um, you know, our, our own sort of clandestine uh, forces have been caught up in criminal activity. And there are, you know, there are very secretive groups of people that no one knows they ever exist until they've, they've disbanded, potentially, like a Task Force 88 or something like that. Um, so the idea that we, we, you know, know for sure that, all, that this is collusion between Trump and Putin and it, it's just so far-fetched I think people should use Occam's razor and realize that the most likely scenario is um, someone inside the DNC who was frustrated and the next most likely scenario then um, would be one of these advanced persistent threats but I can't I can't see that as being viable just because just because of of the fallout that didn't happen from it right the stuff that that doesn't seem to have occurred as a result of the disclosure of all that information um you know i, I think if you're going to use occam's razor and you're going to look at the situation if you're unbiased without a partisan thought to it uh you're you know the conclusion you come to is that the easiest opportunity was for someone on the inside to leak that information, especially because it ended up coming out through WikiLeaks and wasn't utilized uh, by some other government, right? It, it didn't end up in the hands of the North Koreans immediately or the Chinese, which is, you know, probably what would happen if some state actor had taken it. They would have sold it to some other state actor so that they could abuse us with that information, right? I mean, that's, that's just kind of what I think. I don't know. Make your own conclusion. Definitely look into the information. If you if you haven't looked deeply at uh, the CrowdStrike report, if you haven't looked closely at uh, the sort of joint statements made by the different intelligence communities that have weighed in on this, and if you're not if you haven't looked. Uh, specifically at the details surrounding the actual server and how it disappeared. I highly recommend you go look into those things before you make any opinion. Um, and, and then I think once you look at those things, you're going to realize that the mainstream media is definitely lying to you.